Well, if you are stuck at home, sometimes um, you look to the Lord and see what you can do to advance His kingdom. We thank God that one lady did some cookies and sell them, and uh, she will put a copy of the uh, church track uh, in the boxes of cookies that she will deliver to others. And so um, we, there is no excuse for us during this time of semi-lockdown that uh, we cannot advance the cause of Jesus Christ. And we praise God for the heart of that lady. A very good morning to uh, each one of you in Shalom Baptist Church and to all the uh, web viewers out there. This morning, we're going to study on this topic called Shibboleth and the uh, hardened heart. Um, the word Shibboleth simply means a grain or flan right, in the uh, Jewish uh, language. And uh, today, it is also being used in the sense of a jargon or custom. And um, so we're going to look at this a uh, lesson uh, this morning. And before we uh, carry on further, uh, let us uh, seek God's blessing. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to uh, thank you for this uh, blessed privilege to be able to gather in thy presence, Lord, and even with thy words, and also with the uh, power of God in our midst. We seek given your forgiveness for our sins and our failures, and that the blood of Christ will continue to cleanse us from our sins, and that Satan will not hinder by taking away the word that will be sown in our hearts. Bless your word, Lord, even save souls, and even help the believers, Lord, to be uh, strong in their faith, to overcome sins and temptations, and not never ever to have a hardened heart. We commit this sermon to your hands, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. With your Bible, please turn with me to Judges chapter 12 and verse 1 to verse 6. In Judges chapter 12 and verse 1 to verse 6, the scripture reads in verse 1, And the men of Ephron he gathered themselves together, and went northward and said unto Jephthah, Wherefore passed thou over to fight against the children of Ammon? And they does not call us to go with thee. We will burn thy house upon thee with fire. And Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon. And when I call you, ye deliver me not out of their hands. And when I saw that ye delivered me not, I put my life in my hands and passed over against the children of Ammon. And the Lord delivered them into my hand. Wherefore then are ye come up unto me this day to fight against me? Then Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead smoked Ephraim because they said, Ye Gileadites, a fugitive of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manassites. And the uh, Gileadites uh, took the passages of Jordan before the Ephraimites. And it was so when those Ephraimites which were escaped said, Let me go over that the men of Gilead said unto him, are thou an Ephraimite? If he say nay, then say unto them, Say now, Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth, for he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him at the passage of Jordan, and there fell at the time of the Ephraimites forty and two thousand. Well, in the days of uh, Judges, uh, we see at this time that God used Gideon to deliver Israel from the Midianites. In the process, he had to fight the Ammonites too. And when he went to fight the Ammonites, he called the Ephraimites to join him in the battle. But the Ephraimites uh, refused to go into battle with uh, Gideon. And uh, after Gideon has won the battle, the Ephraimites turned around and accused Gideon of not calling uh, them to join him in the battle. And for that, uh, they decided to uh, fight against uh, Gideon and the Gileadites. And uh, so uh, this is the time that we are looking at. And so in the process of the battle, uh, a strange thing happened. There was a uh, gap, a passageway, uh, in which uh, many of these Jews were crossed over. And then in the, in the midst of the battle, they would ask them, are you Ephraimites? Because they were in battle against the Ephraimites. Now, of course, if you know the uh, Jewish people, they all look alike. And uh, in many ways, they spoke the same language. 
And uh, it's hard to differentiate the uh, Ephraimites from the rest of the uh, tribes uh, in Israel. And so uh, I guess some, uh, someone came up with a wise idea and he said to this uh, Jewish people, and he said, uh, can you pronounce Shibboleth? And uh, so the other Jews could pronounce Shibboleth, no problem. But one problem with the Ephraimites is that they could not pronounce Shibboleth. They only can pronounce Sibboleth. Uh, apparently, uh, after some time, when this Israelite settle in that part of uh, the Middle East, and when they mingle among some of the Canaanites, they pick up certain accent and they could not pronounce Shibboleth. And so uh, with that, uh, Gideon and his men uh, destroy about 42,000 of the Ephraimites. Now, uh, I pick this uh, example uh, in our study of the hardening of the heart. Uh, because uh, when the person's heart is hardened, he cannot change. Uh, you can try to persuade him, he won't change. Sometimes even pain, so he won't change. Even the, um, the um, approaching of death, so he won't change. And uh, we see that when a person's character has become so hardened, uh, spiritually, so to speak, he cannot pronounce Shibboleth, and he only can pronounce Sibboleth, because that is his nature. The Bible cautions us in the book of Hebrews, in chapter 3 and verse 12 to verse 14. Take heed, brethren, believers. Um, when the Bible uses the word brethren, it's referring to uh, believers or Christians. And this is a verse for us. All right, we learn to personalize even this verse because Christian can go astray, Christian can harden their hearts, and Christian can be destroyed by God too. The scripture reads, Take it, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exalt one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made particles of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. So this verse wasn't given to the non-believers. It wasn't given to the pagans. This verse was given to the believers in Christ. And we are called to take heed lest we depart from God. And, um, and the Bible says, while well, the Spirit of God and that still small voice in our hearts uh, call us to, unto repentance, let us repent, and let us not harden our hearts, even through the deceitfulness of sin. We are going to look at uh, five characters in the Bible, how they begin as a, an individual with one character, and how they end up with another personality, and how they journey from point A to point B uh, through the process of hardening. Uh, we're going to take a look at Satan, we're going to take a look at Pharaoh, we're going to take a look at the Sodomites, uh, we're going to take a look at Solomon and uh, the thief, uh, uh, the unrepentant thief at the cross. And uh, as I said a while ago, Shibboleth uh, means gate or green or flan, and today is used uh, in reference to custom or jargon. Now we're going to look at the first character, Satan. The scripture reads, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said, In thy heart I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sights of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. And so um, in Isaiah 14 and verse 12 to verse 15, we uh, capture a glimpse of Satan and uh, how we know that when God first made um, uh, Lucifer, uh, he was the uh, most beautiful angel, uh, probably the highest of the order of angels. Uh, some believe he was a choir director. His body is full of uh, musical instruments and precious gem. He must have been an awesome angel to look upon. Uh, but somewhere in the process of time, and this is a mystery because nobody tempted um, Satan. Uh, he literally uh, walked into sin open eyes, with open eyes. 
And uh, Satan said this, I'm going to ascend into the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation. And I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. Satan has a, an ambition to take over the place of God, to be worshipped, to be admired. Um, well, there was a time when I was driving and uh, when it came to a um, traffic light and I stopped at the red light. I saw an interesting uh, man and he took his handphone and then he would uh, kind of uh, look at himself and kind of record himself and kind of touch his hair and look left and you know, look right to see how uh, nice he looks. Um, well, he's quite a narcissistic uh, guy and um, I think that is a glimpse of what Satan is like. Uh, every day he desired to be famous, desired to be well-known, desired to be respected, and desired all these things. In fact, he desired to be God. And we know in the tribulation period, when the third temple will be built, he's going to sit in the temple and then desire to be worshipped or to sit in the place of God and be worshipped. And so uh, this is uh, Satan. Uh, he was born, uh, not he was born, but he was created without sins. And then along the way, sin came to his heart, and then he got hardened, and he became the devil, Satan. And uh, for the rest of his existence, he will never repent all right, from being the devil. Uh, in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 1 to verse 3, And I saw an angel coming down, come down from heaven, having the key to the bot bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him out, and set the seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be lose a little season. So uh, at the uh, end of the uh, seven years tribulation uh, period, uh, when Christ returned with us, and uh, with all the saints, and uh, Christ would uh, imprison uh, Satan in the bottomless uh, pit for a thousand years. Uh, that's a pretty long time. During the Millennium Kingdom, we will, we will not have any distraction until the end of the thousand years. Um, I'm kind of curious, um, in this thousand years, it's almost like being sent to solitary confinement. In short, uh, spend a thousand years, uh, Satan, and think through your, your sins and your loves and your ambition and your pride, and then, I don't know, maybe repent of it. Uh, but that thousand years did Satan no good. It says and, uh, in Revelation 20 and verse 7 to verse 10, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations. We shall in the four quarters of the earth, God and man, God, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breath of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about. And the believer, beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beasts and the false prophets are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Well, sometimes we wonder why there is no salvation to the devil. Well, because he's so hardened that he'll never repent. And um, although we do not know all the theological reason, but um, apparently the devil and his uh, demons, uh, there are no um, repentance for them. Um, so here we see that um, after Satan is loose, uh, after a thousand years, I mean, there's just no change. Time doesn't change him. You know, when our heart is hardened, no amount of time will change him, right? It is the act of the will, it is the attitude, it's the love of Christ that we will change. Time won't change us. And uh, so it is with Satan. Once he's loose, he went about uh, to gather those people who are lost to fight against Jesus Christ. And then the Lord will destroy him in a moment and cast him to the lake of fire where you'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. So Satan literally was on a trajectory uh, straight into the lake of fire. And why is he on that trajectory? It's because of his hardened character. Uh, he had only one direction, one place, one destiny, and that's the lake of fire. 
Now the process of hardening. Uh, gen generally, these are the steps that we uh, go down when we start to harden our hearts. Uh, first, I have seen. I know we all have seen. And that's why the Bible says we need to have good conscience. Keep short account with God. We need to repent. I refuse to repent. Um, so once we come to that stage where we know it's a sin, our conscience tells us it's a sin, and we say, I'm not going to repent anymore. Now the next thing that will happen is I get hardened. Or my heart gets hardened. And then I become insensitive. Uh, it is said that Joseph uh, Stalin, um, during the time of World War II, when he came to power, and uh, he, made, he, he killed, I think, like 14 million of his people. And um, what he, he made a statement, when you kill, some, you kill one person, that's personal, it hurts. But when you kill a million people, that is a statistic, it doesn't hurt. And so you can pass the order, send thousands to the gulags, or kill murder thousands or tens of thousands of the people. You know, he could sleep like a baby. And um, when we, our hearts get uh, hardened, we become insensitive. Nothing is happening to me yet. You know, one thing about God, God is observing our uh, behavior, our actions, you know, our thoughts, our heart. And sometimes God gives us time for us to repent, for us to, to initiate that repentance. And some folks uh, took the patience and the love of God and the mercy of God for granted. In fact, they end up committing more and more sin. It's almost like God is uh, giving you a robe and you pull it longer and longer to hang yourself. And I hope as true believers in the Lord, when God gave us time and nothing is happening, what God is saying is, turn around all right, before it is too late. God gives Samson time to repent. He refused. Later on, the Philistine will burn his eyes out and eventually he just died a premature death. Uh, I morph into uh, another personality. While well, when you study people, the, when they change and their hearts get hardened, they literally move from one personality to another, to somebody unrecognizable. I cross the uh, Rubicon, no turning back. Crossing the Rubicon is, a, is an idiom that is used of coming to a place where there's no more return. It talks about Julius uh, Caesar, when he crossed the Rubicon River, an initiator of a civil war in Rome, and uh, <clears throat> following that, he became the emperor. <clears throat> and once he crossed that the Rubicon River, he knows there's no turning back. And so for a hardened individual, there is an invisible line. And when you cross that line, uh, sometimes there's no more turning back. And it's not that uh, you can, but you don't want. And then I'm destiny, a uh, destined for ultimate destruction, just like uh, Satan. Well, Satan cannot pronounce shib uh, shibboleth. Uh, spiritually speaking, you know, if you tell Satan, if you can pronounce shibboleth, you'll be in heaven, and Satan just can't. You'll be saying shibboleth, shibboleth. Uh, God says, you know, to him, maybe change, repent, whatever. Satan say, you know, I won't, you know, and I don't want to. And uh, once he's released from the bottomless pit, he wants to destroy God again. And uh, so Satan, no matter how many times you tell him, and the opportunity you give him to pronounce Shibboleth, he can't. Now next is uh, Pharaoh. In the book of Exodus in chapter 7, <clears throat> and verse 20 to verse uh, 22, In Exodus chapter 7 and verse 20 to 22, the Bible reads, And Moses and Aaron did so as the Lord commanded, and he lifted up the rod and smoked the waters. There were in the river in the sight of Pharaoh and the sight of his servants, and all the waters that were in the rivers were turned to blood. And the fish that was in the river died, and the river stank, and the Egyptian could not drink of the water of the river. And there was a blood throughout all the land of Egypt, and the magician of Egypt did so with their enchantments. And Pharaoh's heart was harder, neither did he hearken unto them, as the Lord had said. And so uh, we know that uh, at that time, uh, the Israelites were prisoners and uh, slaves in Egypt. 
brothers, slaves in Egypt. And God sent Moses to deliver them. And God told uh, Moses to tell Pharaoh to let his people go, and Pharaoh refused. So God had to use Moses to uh, pronounce the ten plagues. And uh, one of the first plagues is turning the uh, water into blood. And uh, so after Moses had done that, and uh, we see that uh, even the magician could do that also. And so Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he said, uh, you know, I will not let the Israelites go. Now imagine to turn the, the massive rivers of Egypt into uh, blood. I mean, that, I mean, it is no brainer to know that that is the hand of God. It's a miracle of God. And the Egyptian could do probably in a smaller scale. But yet Pharaoh could not recognize that God was against him and God can destroy him and will destroy him if he refused to let his people go. Uh, but once uh, Pharaoh saw that the magicians of Egypt could do it, his heart was hardened. I think it's typical of us, you know, maybe even as believers in the Lord. And when we go into some scene, maybe like smoking or drug or drinking or pornography, and we look at other people and say, hey, lots of people are doing it and nothing is happening to them. You know, and uh, if, if God never judged them, maybe uh, God doesn't exist or, or God is disinterested. And um, we kind of harden our hearts to do more. In Exodus chapter 8 and verse 6 to verse 15, uh, we'll just read a handful of verses. In verse 6, and Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments, and brought up frogs upon the land of uh, Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord. They may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go, that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. So it seems that uh, Pharaoh's heart softened. He is repenting. He said, I'll let the people go. Remove the frogs. Uh, we, as we know right now in Australia, they have the plague of the uh, mice. And if you go on to some of the YouTube clips, uh, it's incredible. <laughs> In fact, they, have to, they had to uh, empty a prison because the mines literally swarmed the prison. And uh, so they had to move the prisoners out of the uh, prison. Now going forward, we see in chapter 8 and then in um, uh, verse, uh, verse 15, verse 13 to verse 15, And the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died of the house. And out of the villages and out of the fields, and they gathered them together upon heaps and the land, uh, land stank. But when Pharaoh saw there was respite, he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them, as the Lord has said. I draw attention to the word respite. And uh, sometimes God chastises a believer, and then God gives him some uh, respite or relief. And that person, instead of being grateful, uh, turn around and, you know, indulge even in more sins. And so it is with Pharaoh, when he saw there was respite, instead of repenting, he hardened his heart, and uh, he would not obey the Lord. And then uh, in chapter 8 and verse 16 to verse 19, Scripture reads, And the Lord said unto Moses, and to Aaron, Stretch out thy rod, and smite the dust of the land. They may become lines throughout all the land of Egypt, and they did so for Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod, and smoked the dance of the earth, and it became lines in men and in beasts, and the dance of the land became lines throughout all the land of Egypt. And the magician did so with their enchantment to bring forth lines, but they could not, so were the lines upon men and upon beasts. Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened on to them as the Lord has said. Wow. So uh, we see here in this third plague, uh, the uh, magician of Egypt trying, but they could not uh, create those uh, lines. And even the magicians of Egypt recognize that this is the finger of God. I don't know some of our chastisement by God. I hope we recognize it is the finger of God. But you see, this Pharaoh's heart was so hardened, they still will not let the people go. And so uh, we see uh, Pharaoh went down that path. 
Now, the interesting thing as we read on with regard to the book of Exodus in chapter 9, verse 12. Now, something interesting happened. Instead of Pharaoh hardening his heart, now God is going to harden Pharaoh's heart. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had spoken unto Moses. In Exodus chapter 10 and in verse 1, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I might show thee sign, uh, these my signs before him. And then in Exodus 10 and verse 20, But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, so that he would not let the children of Israel go. And uh, sometimes um, we are not Calvinists, and we do not believe that God hardened the, uh, the heart of humanity so that they were not believing God. Um, we believe that God gave everyone a fair chance. And if we refuse to have our sins forgiven, to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, and we choose to die in our sins, we end up in hell. We can't say to God, you have not chosen me or you have hardened my heart. Now we got to understand these passages in what is known as judicial hardening. You see, Pharaoh wasn't a nice person that God say, you are a nice man, but uh, because of my, the sovereignty of my will, I'm going to harden you. Well, that was not the case. If you know about Pharaoh's history, he's a Pharaoh that will put all the male babies that were born the Hebrew woman, even to, to drown them and to kill them. Now this is a Pharaoh. You know, it's carrying out almost a genocide upon these uh, Jewish people. Um, so when, when Pharaoh hardened his heart, God will harden Pharaoh's heart. And then we find Pharaoh will go down, that downward spiral. In Exodus chapter 14 and verse 17 to verse 18, the scripture read, And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians. And they shall follow them, and will get me on upon Pharaoh, and upon all his hosts, and upon his chariots, chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gotten me on upon Pharaoh, and upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. So uh, we see now, Pharaoh and the Egyptian army is going on that trajectory into the Red Sea, and eventually will be drowned in the Red Sea. Um, so uh, we see the process of hardening like Satan, Pharaoh will go down the same path. I have sinned, well, next I refuse to repent. All right, I get hardened, I become insensitive. Nothing is happening to me yet. I morph into another personality. I cross the Rubicon, no turning back. I'm destined, I'm destined for the ultimate destruction. Do you know God gave Pharaoh 10 chances for him to repent? because there were 10 plagues. Even until the 10th plague, uh, where the firstborn of Pharaoh and the firstborn of the Egyptian would die, you see, it can't change a hardened heart. And I hope we can understand uh, the, the destructive potential of a hardened heart. Never walk down that path to have a hardened heart. Pharaoh cannot pronounce Shibboleth. God gave him 10 chances to pronounce Shibboleth in that spiritual sense. And each time Pharaoh would say, Sibbalat, because he refused to repent. He hardened his heart. Never mind the plague of the frog, the plague of the lies, you know, the plague of the hills, and finally the plague of, even of the death of the firstborn. All right? It's no use uh, for a hardened heart. Pharaoh cannot pronounce Sibbalat. He only can say Sibbalat, Sibbalat. Next, we want to see the Sodomites. The Bible reads, For this cause God gave them up unto vow affections. For even their women did change their natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts one towards another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was me. Okay, now uh, the Bible tells us in the book of Romans how the invisible things from the creation of the world are clearly seen, but man turned away from God. And when he turns away from God, uh, he indulged in all this um, vile sin. In fact, a uh, sin that, um, which is so, uh, I would say, nauseating, uh, where men start to cohabitate with men and ladies start to cohabitate with uh, ladies. And they actually burn in their lungs, man for man and ladies for ladies. 
This is what we call the LGBT movement. Um, when you see a man kissing a man, I mean, your conscience tells you it's sick. And when you see a lady kissing a lady, you know, your conscience tells you it is sick. But the men will harden their heart to the point where they violate their conscience and they think it's a perfect, normal, alternative uh, lifestyle. We don't agree to that. I'm glad the government doesn't agree to that. And uh, we see here that um, many times people say that, um, you know, they are born with that nature. Um, there's enough um, candidates and example of people who were once a lesbian or homosexual or saw the man. Uh, when they come to know Jesus Christ and give their heart to the Lord, they change. I mean, there are loads of testimony you can find on the internet. You know how ladies turn around and become he he uh, heterosexual, marry a man and bear children, and then put, put behind their past. And um, it is a, for many people, it's just a learned behavior. Now let's look at the Sodomites. The Bible reads, Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known men. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto this man do nothing, for therefore came they under the roof, the shadow of my roof. But the man put forth their hand and put Lord into the house to them and shut to the door. And they smoked the man that were the door of the house with blindness, both small and great. So that, listen carefully, they wearied themselves to find the door. Well, this is talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, which um, got destroyed with fire and brimstone eventually. After these two angelic beings would bring a lot and his two daughters out of Sodom. Uh, but before that happened, the two angelic beings were with a lord. And then the uh, inhabitants heard of these two handsome men coming to town. At night, the whole town or the whole city came to Lord's house and they want to um, cohabitate or uh, uh, have a sexual intercourse uh, with these two men. And Lord say, hey, I give you my two doors. They say, we don't want your doors. And now we just want these two men. And then God judged them. God blinded their eyes. And then you have, think, you have thought that, hey, when God blinded their eyes, you know, they'd be crying out to God, forgive me and I repent, I'm going to change. Uh, but nothing of that sort. Instead, in their blind state, you know, they were still feeling and trying to find the door to Lord's house and just to have one last fling uh, with these two uh, handsome angelic beings. And uh, we see the, uh, the outcome of a hardened heart. I mean, it's unbelievable, it's crazy. And so even the point of time, they know their judge, their sight were taken from them, but they still want to continue in their sins. And so folks never underestimate, you know, that's a process of hardening and that place of hardening where nothing will change you. And all you want is to consume in your lungs. And so when they saw the mind, uh, this is what happened. They went down the same process. I've seen, I refuse to repent, I get hardened, I become insensitive. Nothing is happening to me yet. God gave them a period of time to repent these other minds. I morph into another personality. I mean, you can't recognize these animals. You know, despite the fact they were blind, they still want to have one last fling with that two angelic beings. I cross the Rubicon, there is no turning back. I mean, God can punish them, going to rain fire and brimstone, they still will not repent. I'm destined for the ultimate destruction. And so they saw the minds cannot pronounce Shibboleth. And uh, spiritually asked them, you know, I mean, you'll go to heaven, you know, I mean, uh, uh, you will live longer, provided you can spiritually pronounce Shibboleth. And they say, we can't. They keep saying, Shibboleth. And um, despite the fact they were blinded, they still will not change. Their hearts will not turn back to God in repentance. Solomon uh, is quite enigmatic in the sense that this is a man of God. Uh, of the uh, first three people we studied, they were lost people. But now we are looking at a saved person, King Solomon. Now Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs, he wrote Ecclesiastes, he wrote the Song of Solomon. And uh, when you read those three uh, uh, inspired scripture that in which God used him and penned down his word, uh, you would think that Solomon is a man of solid character. 
I mean solid spirituality because he warned people against sin. He warned people don't walk down that path. Don't get your heart hardened. Be careful of strange ladies and so on. In Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 5 to verse 7, I'll just read part of it. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. To understand the proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. You see, Solomon said this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And if you fear God, you are going to be a wise man. Because when you keep the commandments of God, you get wiser and wiser. You get blessed more and more. You live victorious life. You enjoy life. You enjoy your walk and relationship with God. And Solomon said, fools despise wisdom and instruction. You see, some years down the road, I'm sure some of the good counselor of Solomon will say to him, this is not right. You can't build tempers for your wife. You can't even go and... Um, and, and uh, bring offerings to this temple. You know, and Solomon would do exactly diametrically opposite what he has been instructing his people. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And in his wildest imagination, Solomon didn't realize he was writing to himself because one day he'll be that fool. In Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 1 to verse 4, My son, forget not my law, but let thy heart keep uh, my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee, bind them upon thy neck, write them upon the table of thy heart. And so shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. I heard one preacher say that the book of Proverbs was written to his son. All right, it's something that Solomon wanted to pass down to his son, that they would fear God and keep his commandments. And uh, you can almost sense his passion and his love for God when he said, My son, forget not my law, uh, but let thy heart keep my commandments. And uh, Solomon, some years down the road, were to break all of God's commandments. Uh, he said in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23 to 27, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Let thy eyes look on, uh, look right on, and let thy eyelids uh, look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet. And let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left, and remove thy foot from evil. See, Solomon said this, Keep thy heart uh, with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Solomon knew where was the better ground, deep in our heart, you know, invisible to, the, uh, to other people. Uh, but uh, it is buried deep in our heart, and that's where the battles are won or lost. And Solomon said, keep your heart with all diligence. And then the path that Solomon is walking, he said, look straight on. Don't turn to the left, don't turn to the right, and uh, remove your foot uh, from evil. All good advice, but these are the same thing that uh, Solomon will walk on to the left and to the right in sin. Um, in 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 4 to verse 6, the scripture reads, And it came to pass when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord as his, his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon, Solomon went after Ashtaron, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after the Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father. You see, when Solomon was old, he changed to another personality. And so we wonder how did he get from point A to point B. Once, his heart was so sensitive to God's leading. You know, he loves God. And so God bless him. He has a fantastic kingdom. Uh, it prospered. Uh, and there was peace in his kingdom. But uh, there is a verse in the Bible where God said to the king, do not multiply wives. And Solomon married about a thousand ladies. And in, in his old age, his wives turned his heart away from God. And so literally, Solomon almost behaved like a pagan. I mean, you can't imagine, say, a Baptist pastor go to maybe a temple and then, some, you know, some paganistic temples to worship uh, some other gods or goddesses, but this is what Solomon did. And um, it's abomination in the eyes of God. 
But uh, that's what he did. Well, how did Solomon come to that place where he turned into another person? Uh, well, same like Satan, same like uh, the Sodomites. And so he said, I've seen, I mean, I've seen, I refuse to repent, I get hardened. I become insensitive, nothing is happening to me yet. I morph into another personality. I cross the Rubicon, all right, no turning back. I'm destined for the ultimate destruction. You see, God will tear his kingdom into two, and uh, his uh, son, um, Rehoboam, will be left with two tribes, and the other ten tribes will be given to Jeroboam, one of his generals. And um, God raised up his, his uh, enemies to Solomon, and Solomon never had peace in his old age. Now, King Solomon cannot pronounce Shibboleth. You know, when he's old, you know, he Solomon, can you change? Burn down the temples, maybe. You know, quit the worshipping idols. And Solomon said, I can't. I mean, I mean the forgo your wives, your pagan wives. I can't. All right? Solomon cannot pronounce Shibboleth anymore. Or he could say Shibboleth. Shibboleth. The thief at the cross. In Luke chapter 23 and verse 39 to verse 43, and one of the male factors which were hang real on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear, uh, uh, dost thou fear God? Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we received the due reward of our deeds. But this man had done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I send to thee today, shalt thou be with me in paradise. We often focus on the thief on the cross that accepted Christ. We seldom focus on the other thief uh, that did not accept Christ. And it's really mind boggling. I mean, this thief, uh, the other thief at the cross, or the unrepentant thief at the cross, um, he probably committed crimes, killing, you know, murder some people. His heart was so hardened. And then when they arrested him, he still wasn't uh, repenting. And not only that, when they, they drive the nail into his uh, wrist and hang him on the cross, you know, his, minds, uh, his mind was exploding with pains. And he's still not repenting. And then he could, he must have heard of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And the other thief would say, Lord, remember me. You know, and salvation is just next to him. The Savior was next to him. And, uh, you know, he, I mean, he experienced all the shame and all the guilt. And his mind boggling as, you know, his life was ebbing away and the pain was shooting into his brain. Um, and that last moment, I can imagine, you can count 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. And this unrepentant thief would say, I still want my last. You know, I still you know, remember my crimes and uh, so on. And I would not take Jesus Christ to be my Savior. Even if I die and go to hell and be tormented day and night forever, I don't want. All right? His heart is so hard. It is said that there was a man and um, he went to the priest. And the priest was, you know, want to kind of forgive him for his uh, moral sins. And uh, he said to the priest, he said, I've been a... Uh, uh, what do you call that? Um, I've been the kind of um, a sailor, traveling from port to port. And every port I'll visit these pretty ladies, you know what I mean, and join them and so on. And he said, you know, I uh, said, I can't repent of this thing uh, because it was so enjoyable. And uh, the priest finally, you know, come to his, came to his wits and he said, uh, will you repent of the fact that you cannot repent? And that sailor say, yeah, you know, I'll repent of the fact that I cannot repent of my past, uh, you know, last for these ladies. Then the priest said, I forgive you. Uh, some folks come to the stage of their life. They are so hardened, they just can't repent. And um, so uh, this uh, thief at the cross is really mind-boggling. In the sense, his dying was in pain. He knows that probably he's going to be lost. You're going to end up in hell for all the sins and crimes and murders he has done. But yet he would rather die and go to hell if, uh, and, and the Savior is just next to him. He will not uh, accept him and receive forgiveness. 
Well, the process of hardening is the same. I've seen, I refuse to repent, I get hardened, become insensitive, nothing's happening to me yet. I morph into another personality, I cross the Rubicon, no turning back, destined for the ultimate uh, destruction. And uh, the unrepentant thief cannot pronounce Shibboleth. I mean, it's so simple, right? You know, just say Shibboleth, you know, but they just keep saying Shibboleth. Because even the Savior, the Messiah, is next to him. He still will not take him to be his Savior. He'd rather die and go to hell. Now, we are reminded again in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12 to verse 14. This verse is for the believers. Take it, brethren. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily what is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And so the scripture reminds us, today if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart through the deceitfulness of sin. Uh, because sin is deceitful. Now sin is deceitful because they shortchange you. Um, so you buy something, you pay a thousand dollars, you get something that's only worth ten dollars. You say, man, I've been shortchanged. Uh, like some folks, uh, they go to buy a car, a used car, and then uh, you know, six months down the road, they discover that car went through the flood and it, start, it starts to break down. It hardens your heart. Sin is deceitful because it hardens your heart. It has a long-term effect. It hides the consequences. Just like Satan told Eve, when you take it, you'll be you know, wise just like God. Didn't tell, him, didn't, didn't tell her she's going to die. She's going to have childbirth pain. Mankind will be plunged into darkness and uh, suffering and sin and death and pains and sorrow. Uh, Satan didn't tell all right, Adam and Eve that. Just simply told them, if you take it, you're going to be like God's. You're going to be wise. And uh, the one thing about sin, sin always tells you one half the story. Right? Sin doesn't tell you the other half, the worst half. Right? It affects all those you love. We are seeing short change you, and we are familiar with this dog with the bone and saw his reflection. And out of covetousness, he, want, he wanted the other bone. And of course, in the process, when he, opened, when he, when he opens his mouth, it, 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 it loses his bone, uh, the bone that he had. And um, so in sin, you're going to lose what you origin, originally had and inherit what you shouldn't have. When I think about this, I think about many, many sad families. All right, the man uh, got into an affair with some pretty ladies. And then you see the wives, you know, really literally shattered and the children are heartbroken. And um, they discover the new wife is actually no different from the old wife. The problems are just rearranged. Um, but they, he lost a beautiful family. And uh, he could have a beautiful family for the rest of his life. Sin will shortchange you. Sin promises gains, but uh, it gives you a loss, just like Achan. In all the gold and silver we studied in the earlier sermon, and in the midst of the battle, he was, they were told not to um, cover it. He dug a hole and hid it, and he thought he'd come back and become a rich man. For that, he, he and his family were stoned to death. Uh, Sin promises wealth, like Judas is Karen. Uh, he thought that he could sow the Savior for 30 pieces of silver and make some money. Uh, but his condemned conscience haunted him so badly that the only way out, he killed himself. He committed suicide. You see, no hands need to uh, hang Judas Iscariot. His own hands did the job. Sin promise you pleasure, but gives you shame like David and Bathsheba. Sin promise you mastery. Ye shall be as God. That's what Satan said to Adam and Eve. But in the end, they turn out to be not gods, but fools. Uh, he gave them weakness, and that's why we are experiencing all these sorrows in this room. Sin promises you everything, but gives you nothing. It's just like the lost man who say, you know, when Christ said, What shall you profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? Well, sin promises you the whole world, you can have it. But what does it get you when you lose your soul in hell to be tormented day and night forever and ever? Sin promises you satisfaction, it leaves you emptiness. You see, there was a Zacchaeus, a tax collector in the days of Jesus. And he had lots of money, but he had no joy, no peace. 
And one day he heard about Jesus coming to town. He, being a short guy, he climbed up the tree to hear Jesus Christ. And when Christ said, come down, I'll be with you tonight for dinner. You know, Zacchaeus, the tax collector, say, I'll give half of my fortune to the poor, and those that have cheated, I'll pay them fourfold. And Jesus says, salvation is come to his home. You see, Zacchaeus had enough of a condemned conscience. He wanted peace and wanted joy. And um, so sin promise, uh, promises satisfaction, but it gives us emptiness. And we thank God that Zacchaeus turned around and found the real satisfaction in Jesus Christ. Have you been a soul alignment? Well, alignment means you buy something, you thought that is something good, working and so on. You discover it's just a, a useless thing. And so uh, it's just a common a phrase that people will use, especially in Australia. And sometimes they say, I bought the lineman, meaning that it was not what uh, was, um, they were told. Well, sin hardens your heart. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, someone one. Well, who is the blessed man? He doesn't walk in the counsel of the godly. He doesn't stand in the way of sinners. He doesn't sit in the seat of scornful. And so we see the progression, how uh, sin hardens our heart. And now when you think about the word walk, it's a very casual thing. You know, you kind of slaughter down the uh, path and you start to observe sin and start to appreciate and join them. I mean, it's just harmless, it's just a walk into the path of sin. And you... Then after you have been walking for a long time in that pathway of sin, you start to stand for sin. Right? The idea when you stand for something, you start to defend it. You know, somebody say, I stand for this and I stand for abortion, I stand for righteousness or something, you start to defend it. And of course, we don't subscribe to abortion. Um, sin, uh, you know, after you've been walking for a while, you start to defend sin. You know, you start to say, well, everybody's doing it. It's not as bad as you think, and so on and so forth. And then finally, you sit in the seat of the scornful. And when somebody gets seated, it's a picture of becoming comfortable. You know, sin doesn't trouble you anymore. You start to believe it, start to enjoy it, start to defend it. And you start to become comfortable. And this is the progression down to a hardened heart. Well, sin also has a long-term effect. For Adam, you affect the whole humanity. For David, it affected his children. A number of his kids dying. When God pronounced judgment and said, the sword shall not depart from your house, Abraham affected the Jewish nation. Um, if you want to know who are the Arab people, well, they are the descendants of Ishmael, largely. And they, Ishmael and Isaac, they were actually uh, kind of half-brothers in that sense. Um, Abraham, uh, because he was impatient with God, uh, he um, had a, a, a child through Hagar, handmaid, uh, instead of waiting upon God to have the promised seed, Isaac, through um, Sarah. Most of us will have a dark past memories which we wish can be erased, shame that we hope nobody will ever find out, and give the horns on even to the grave. And it begins at the beginning the innocuous uh, first step into sin. And that's why Solomon said, keep that heart with all diligence. Turn not to the left, to the right. Look straight on. But that we thank God that uh, some of us, we may feel like we are hopeless. You know, but um, as long as we have the breath, there's still the chance and opportunity to repent and to receive Jesus Christ to be your Savior. In Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26, we reference to the Jewish nation. God says, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. And so uh, God say to the Israelites, You know something, when you humble yourself, when you turn around and let me take over your life, I can give you a heart of flesh, and I will take out the heart of stone. And uh, Satan is a predatory uh, lion. Well, when you're dealing with hardening heart, try to visualize it. Have you ever seen in the wild, in the savannas, and the lion chasing the gazelle, you know, or the uh, cheetah chasing the deer? 
I mean, they are running for their life. And Satan is a roaring lion, walker about seeking whom he may devour. I mean, when you see that chase and that animal, uh, the facial expression is terrifying. Uh, they know if they don't run fast enough, they'll get killed. And so sin is like that lion, that cheetah, that tiger that is chasing us. All right, sin is not a pussycat, right? And we need to uh, run fast and run away from sin. Now the same person, a positive note can also be hardened in a positive sense. All right, uh, we can be hardened into the perfect man. Because every time we are tested, we trust God, we thank God, we believe in God, and then we come out victorious. We can be the obedient son, the loving husband, the submissive wife. The reason I put it down, the hardest place for us to be perfected is in our home. Uh, the trusting believer, the faithful steward, the victorious Christian, the consistent soul winner. I mean the believers can be hardened in a positive sense. So hardened that nothing stops them from being the consistent soul winner, soul winner the faithful steward serving God. And uh, there are some hardened believers in the Bible. Jesus Christ, when he was about going to the, when he was about to die at the cross, he said, "Not my will, but Thy will be done." You see, he was so hardened to follow God and to do His will. Paul said, uh, "To die is gain." I can imagine in those days he would tell Paul, "Said, you know, if I were going to kill you unless you deny Christ, Paul probably will probably say that go ahead." Because for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul is so hard in a positive sense that even the sword doesn't threaten him. Uh, Job, when he lost everything, he could say, The Lord gave, the Lord had taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. See, Job is hardened in a positive sense. When all these uh, tragedies come, came suddenly, uh, Job responded victoriously because he was so hardened in that positive sense. James said, count it all joy when he found the diverse temptation. James was once denying Christ, um, but then uh, he came, turned around and uh, he was um, asking the believers to count it all joy. Daniel, when uh, the pronouncement was made that they cannot pray to their God except to King Darius, uh, Daniel opened his window you know, and uh, thanked God and prayed three times a day. Um, Daniel was so hardened that even the threat of death or going to the lion's den uh, doesn't stop him from praying to God three times a day. Peter said, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. You see, Peter became so hardened, he can look at all this fiery trial and he say, Hey, it's nothing strange. Uh, it's going to perfect me and going to bless me and reward me. And the saints is... When they were tortured, the Bible said they didn't accept deliverance, that they can obtain a better resurrection. You see, they are hardened in a positive way. Now, what you are tomorrow, it is said that you are becoming uh, today. And so don't underestimate the day-to-day -day trials and temptations because your character is being formed. It's like a wet uh, a, a lump of clay. You know, every moment it is hardening for the battle of our words. Um, well, uh, if you are an unbeliever, and sometimes you wonder what is Christianity, it talks about the love of God, talks about God, a Savior, Jesus Christ. The Son of God and God the Son who came to this world some 2,000 years ago to die for our sin. And there were two thieves on the cross. Uh, one said, I reject the Messiah. I'd rather die in my sin. But the other one said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. While the other thief on the cross, like most thieves on the cross, they were there because of some, um, usually they're crucified because of murders. And um, his heart was hardened, but he turned around and uh, he took Jesus to be his savior. So um, we see no matter how bad a pass, as long as you still got a breath, there's still a God who loves you and wants to save you. He came to identify with you, die for you, pay your sins. And Christ 
rose up from the dead after three days. People that we have studied Satan, we have studied Pharaoh, we have studied the Sodomites, King Solomon, and the thief on the cross, or the unrepentant thief. Um, we see that these people will not repent. And I just draw your attention to the second paragraph. They said unto him, Say now, Shibbalan. And he said, Sibbalan. For he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him at the passages of Jordan, and there fell at that time of the Ephraimite. Ephraimites, 40 and 2,000. And so, forget about the idea that I can go so far into sin, but someday I'm able to turn around. Right, you probably wouldn't. You probably cannot pronounce by then, Shibboleth. With that, uh, this time, uh, let us pray. Precious Lord, we thank you for your word. And we thank you, Lord, even for the understanding of this biblical truth, that sin is not a pussycat, but sin is a rolling lion. Sin can change us into someone that we may not recognize. And while we still have life, while we still have this breath, the Lord even uh, we will turn around. And Lord, especially for many young people that uh, who are looking at sin and taking it lightly, and now repenting of their sins, that, Lord, they will come of it quickly and get their hearts right with thee. Thank you for your word and save souls. We pray in Christ's most precious name. Amen.